We now have Re Rebecca Marsh from uh, Cincinnati on HLH, which is, of course, uh, requires an allogeneic approach. Well, thank you, and thank you so much to Rashmi and John for inviting me, and it's always an honor to speak in the same session as Paul Vase. So with that, I will get started. Um, and I'm going to talk about definitive transplant for HLH because we do sometimes consider, especially some of these patients with recurrent inflammatory MAS, um, to be sort of on the HLH spectrum of things, so a related disorder. So I'm going to start, I know we have several parents in the audience, just with a little bit of a simplistic overview of allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplantation to sort of walk you through the steps of having a bone marrow transplant. I'll go through a little bit of the history of transplant for HLH, talk about our current approach at Children's and some other places, and then some efforts that we're undertaking to further improve transplant survival outcomes for patients with HLH. So... Why, first of all, do we transplant patients with HLH? And you heard this very well from Christina Demin yesterday, but genetic HLH is generally a fatal disease. And I believe she quoted about 40%, which is what's observed in the trials. But really, if you consider the lifetime of patients, the mortality is actually higher than that without a definitive cure. And so people many years ago, this predates me, wondered if the possible benefit of transplant for genetic HLH patients is worth the risk. So sort of those conversations that you guys are starting to have now for systemic JIA. And really for the parents, when someone mentions that you might have to have a transplant if nothing else works, and you don't seem to get a clear answer about should we do this or not, it's because the, the question and the answer are both very difficult. So I would argue that for most patients with primary immune deficiencies, including most patients with HLH, the risk of having a transplant for all comers completely all comers, it becomes very individualized risk based on your particular patient, but for all comers could be estimated to be about 20% risk of dying post-transplant from a complication. Now in HLH, we know that the disease risk is more than that. So we know that the disease risk for patients with HLH is greater than 20%. So that's why we go down these, this path for these patients. Now, how do we do a bone marrow transplant? I'm gonna give you six simple steps. And of course, it's not this easy, um, but for the sake of today, we're gonna to talk about how transplant is like planting a garden. I think someone else, um, the keynote speaker two days ago gave a similar analogy. Um, but step one is really to decide who to transplant. And so in our case, we're transplanting patients with genetic mutations and genes that cause HLH. Now I put an asterisk by XIP deficiency because there certainly are a subset of these patients that seem to have milder courses. We're really starting to think about this disease as being more of an inflammasomopathy. Um, so certainly many patients require transplant, but there are a subset of those patients that probably could do without transplant. Very young patients with HLH, even if we don't find a gene, if you're very young and you have HLH, and especially if it's recurrent, there's likely a gene, we just aren't smart enough to know what it is yet. Patients with HLH in a family history, same argument. Patients with HLH that's recurrent, so even if you're 22, if you've had three or four episodes of HLH, that patient may very well warrant a transplant. And some patients with severe refractory HLH spectrum inflammatory diseases such as systemic JIA and recurrent MAS. So step two, you have to find an appropriate donor. And for some of the parents, this is one of the most critical steps or decision points in deciding if a transplant would be a good option for your child. So ideally, you will find a 10 out of 10 bone marrow donor at our center, preferably you know, would be a sibling or a related donor. Um, but if you have an unrelated fully matched donor, generally outcomes are predicted to be good, and we would consider that a tick box in the should we perhaps consider perhaps this um, list. We may consider a 9 out of 10 donor. Um, generally, we don't go less than that because survival decreases with mismatch. You can consider peripheral blood stem cell grafts. This is actually the graft of choice at other centers. There's a little bit more risk of chronic graft versus host disease. You can consider cord blood grafts. However, I will say that you need a higher intensity prep in general if you're doing a cord blood transplant. You can also rarely consider haploidentical transplants, and especially now with post-transplant cyclophosphamide, a lot of centers are adopting this approach. We're not so much adopting it for patients with HLH at this time. So step three, you really have to consider what kind of conditioning are you going to give your patient. So Paul was talking a lot about using reduced intensity conditioning regimens, and we'll talk about intensity in just a minute. 
but you really need a good serotherapy as part of your transplant. So what does that mean and what it's for? So serotherapy is really a, usually a non-chemotherapic agent, so either alemtuzumab or more rarely ATG, that's going to deplete the patient's immune system and reduce the risk of graft rejection. Now these agents often linger. In the case of alemtuzumab, it can actually hang around for two months post-transplant. And so these things are also going to deplete the T cells in the graft, and they're very useful for also decreasing your risk of graft-versus-host disease. We also have to give chemotherapy, and this is what's gonna make room in the bone marrow for the new graft to grow. So you have to clean out the bone marrow. So this is like if you're gonna plant a garden, you first have to get rid of whatever's growing in the field where you wanna plant your garden. So that's what we're doing with our chemotherapy. And in children's, what we use is generally melphalan and fludarabine. More rarely, we may be using fludarabine and busulfan. Step four, you've got to harvest the stem cells. So in most cases at our center, this is bone marrow that we're harvesting, but you can also collect cord blood. You can also collect peripheral blood stem cells. Step five, you're gonna infuse those cells into your cute little patient. And step six, what's step six? So step six is really time. And people, especially parents, always worry about the chemotherapy and the transplant itself, but I will tell you that usually that's the easiest part of having a transplant. What's tricky and dangerous is what's coming afterwards. So after we infuse the cells, you really have to have time for your new immune system to start to grow. You have to have time for your neutrophils to grow, which happens in about two weeks. But your T and B cells, those don't grow back and they're not normal for usually around a year post-transplant and sometimes B cell recovery takes even longer, two years. But for patients who get to a year post-transplant, haven't had severe graft-versus-host disease, haven't had an infection that we couldn't treat, we expect most of these patients will go on to then continue to have good survival. Now, what can go wrong? Lots of things. The biggest barriers to survival, though, still remain toxicities from the conditioning regimen, graft-versus-host disease, which is when the donor's immune system attacks the patient's body because it recognizes that body as being foreign, infections, and these things are somewhat modified by the conditioning regimen. So what kinds of transplant regimens are there? And I hear, I hear Paul Vays use the word packages a lot, and these really are packages of drugs that go together to do a transplant. And what you can see on the spectrum is that at the one end, we have really harsh, very strong, traditional, completely myeloablative conditioning regimens. So 15 years ago, 20 years ago, patients with HLH would have been getting busulfan, cyclophosphamide, and ATG. And we saw a lot of toxicities with those regimens, so people have scaled back. And on this other end of the spectrum, there may be certain cases, and especially this happens in other primary immune deficiencies like SCID, where we may choose to give nothing or just some serotherapy and some fludarabine. And in the middle, we have what's called reduced intensity alemtuzumab, fludarabine, and melphalan, which, if you'll notice, is towards this non myeloablative spectrum. And what that means is that we're not always killing off every single bone marrow cell. So after transplant with this type of approach, you may actually have cells from the patient that grow back along with cells from the donor. So I mentioned that myeloablative regimens are poorly tolerated by HLH patients, and this is probably because these patients have a high degree of inflammation going into transplant. And what we see in these patients is that we get a lot of you know, occlusive disease of the liver, a lot of pneumonitis, a lot of pulmonary hemorrhage, and what's really important, we see a lot of deaths prior to day 100. And this is very early death post-transplant, almost always attributed to toxicity from your conditioning regimen. As you can see here, this is just a summary of myeloablative preparative regimen transplants for patients with HLH since the year 2002. And what you can see is really um, survival being around 50 to 60% for these patients. So obviously we would like that to be better and then about 10, 12, 15 years ago, reduced intensity conditioning regimens were pioneered at two places, one with Paul Vase's group at Great Ormond Street. There were two patients with XLP that were treated with reduced intensity conditioning in 2000 and 2005. And then Shalini Chinoy, who's at WashU, also pioneered a similar regimen with alemtuzumab, fludarabine, and melphalan for non-malignant diseases. And they treated two patients with HLH. And then also at Great Ormond Street, they published a bunch of the largest series of 12 patients in 2006. So we also adopted this type of approach for our patients um, with HLH. And what you can see is that in 
improvement to survival to about 80%. So this is 75 to 92%. And I will tell you, any transplanter tells you that absolutely survival should be 90%. It's usually a little too high. So if you go longer term follow up, um, you will not see quite as good survival. And what you can see is here at our center, we actually doubled our survival um, using this type of approach but that with longer term follow-up, so going out many years, we really expect that about 80% of patients um, with HLH should survive post having a reduced intensity conditioning transplant. Now, I threw this in just because people yesterday were asking about um, IL-18 levels for patients with systemic GIA, GIA going into transplant. And this is from Sharat Chandra, who had a nice um, abstract at ESID. But what you can see here is these are the levels of a patient going into transplant with levels anywhere from you know, 60,000 to about 200,000 pre-transplant. Post-transplant, those levels really do come down very nicely by about four months um, into the normal range. And a second patient, similar outcome there. So I do like to give a special note about XIP deficiency because they do seem to be just a little more prone even than generic HLH patients to toxicities. And several years ago, we did an international survey um, with Kenshin Rao and several folks at GOS and other European and US centers. And what you can see here is that the outcomes for patients with XIP deficiency um, are quite poor actually, even with reduced intensity conditioning regimens in general. But if those patients go into transplant and remission from their HLH, outcomes look really, you know, pretty much where we would expect them, around 80%. And we've gone on now and done about 15 patients with XIP deficiency. And what we see is that if you lack any complications of graft versus host disease after transplant, we see about 100% survival. Now, is that always going to be 100% survival? No. So over time, this will change based on patient population. But these patients may be a little more prone to complications of graft versus host disease. We've noticed these patients tend to have GVHD that's just sort of more difficult to treat and that has resulted in death um, the majority of the time. So what about complications? So I'm not going to talk a lot about this. You heard from Paul already that we see lots of viremias with alemtuzumab. Um, we see CMV in about a third of our patients. We see adenovirus in about 50%. We definitely see BK virus, um, really HHV6, et cetera. You do need close monitoring. So twice a week, our patients are getting PCRs drawn every Monday, Thursday morning. Um, and you do often need treatment. And we start treatment before infection develops. So we try to catch it you know, when patients are just viremic. We also get the development of mixed donor and recipient chimerism. And you don't need 100% chimerism to not get sick with HLH. This is true for all primary immune deficiencies. You need somewhere between 10 to 20% of cells from your donor. And then this approach has a very low risk of graft versus host disease, but it's not zero, but it's less than 15%. This is to show you Kylenberg in Germany actually collected about 100 patients of HLH who developed mixed chimerism so that we can try to determine where is the risk threshold for relapse of HLH. And what you can see is that less than 30%, if you look at the far right, um, there are some patients who become at risk and actually develop either a full flare or a partial flare of HLH, and also less than 10%. That risk goes up even more. But what you will notice is actually there are a lot of patients with low-level donor chimerism who don't necessarily relapse and develop HLH again. So it's not an automatic that if you have 8% donor chimerism after transplant, you should automatically move to transplant. But we do watch those patients quite closely. I always like to make a point that mixed chimerism is not something that's unique to HLH. I hear it a lot. It must be the really high interferon gamma levels, and that's why it's such a problem to get sustained engraftment in these patients. But this is a cumulative incidence curve, and what you can see in black is the incidence of mixed chimerism in patients with HLH and XLP. And then these other disorders are combined immune deficiency, metabolic disorders, severe combined immune deficiency. And what you can see is that the incidence is pretty similar. And so really the mixed chimerism that we're seeing is because this isn't a myeloablative preparative regimen. Now, if you have floridly active HLH going into transplant, absolutely, that's gonna be a problem to get a graft in to begin with. And that probably is very dependent on the level of inflammation and may have to do with interfering gamma levels. And you'll see the group here that's protected from developing mixed chimerism. Those are parents with marrow failure. So why would marrow failure patients not develop mixed chimerism after transplant? because they have a crappy marrow going in, and so it's, it's not going to grow back very well after transplant. So 
Mixed chimerism risk we've learned over the last few years is um, really determined by your alemtuzumab level, and it probably has to do with the extent of T cell depletion of your graft. And we know that if you measure levels of alemtuzumab on day zero, which is the day that we put the graft in, if you have very high levels of alemtuzumab, you have essentially 100% risk of developing mixed chimerism. If you have much lower levels, as shown here, and this would really be a non-lytic level, so this is a level of alemtuzumab that's either zero or low enough that we don't expect it to actually cause any lysis of the donor T cells, your risk is much lower. And if you have an in-between level, you have an in-between incidence. Acute GVHD also follows this risk. So in this top graph, what you see is that the incidence of any grade of graft-versus-host disease is up near 70% if you don't have a lytic level of alemtuzumab on day zero, so that's quite high, versus if you have alemtuzumab on board. This is your risk of acute graft-versus-host disease. And then we really care most about grades three and four graft-versus-host disease because these are the really severe forms of GVHD. These are the patients that are not going to do well, most likely long-term, and what you can see is the same association with the alemtuzumab level. Now, just because um, we talk about you know, data on 100 HLH patients, et cetera, it's always really good to look at larger experiences, even in other diseases that are not HLH, because it gives you a much better flavor for what survival estimates can be. So this is data from the CIBMTR for national sibling donor transplant outcomes for non-malignant diseases. So this does include histiocytic disorders, also skid, marrow failures, metabolic diseases. And what you can see is that in the most recent past, outcomes for sibling donors are right around 90%. Outcomes for patients who have an unrelated donor, you know, just below 80%, somewhere, I'm not sure exactly what that is, maybe 75%. And with that, I will conclude just by saying that 14-day alentuzumab, fludarabine, and melphalan reduced intensity conditioning transplant as a recommended regimen um, for patients with HLH and also related disorders, you know, including patients with systemic JIA, MAS. There's about a 30 to 40 percent risk of mixed chimerism. Um, I don't have time to talk about it today, but we will often intervene for patients with giving T cells from the donor or just giving more stem cells from the donor. We do have about a 5 percent retransplant risk, so that's known. You have a 1 in 20 chance of needing another transplant going in. Mixed chimerism risk, though, is worth the survival benefit that we see with this approach. Alemtuzumab, fludarabine, and melphalan should not routinely be used for cord blood transplant. Don't have time to talk about that today, but we do see a very high incidence of mixed chimerism. And we haven't actually lost a graft yet, but I think that's been luck. I think that's a very real concern with this prep. Um, and further improvement with targeted precision dosing of alemtuzumab and also melphalan will likely lead to improved donor chimerism and increase long-term survival. So we actually just submitted an R21 to do a precision dosing trial of alemtuzumab, and actually Prenda Mehta and Shrat Chandra at my center have a melphalan trial already going. So with that, I'll say thank you to the patients and families, um, Lisa Filipovich, Stella Davies, um, the International XIP Transplant Study Group, including Kenshin Rao and Paul Vase, and the other folks on the slide. Thank you very much.